I didn't win the lawsuit, but everybody knows I wrote that song. Hello? Gosh, it's been forever. You look fantastic. It's John. Pam, from the blind date we went on years ago? Ah, the struggling actor who didn't believe he could save his snapshot based on how and how much he drives. I I'd love to talk about it over dinner sometime. Well, I usually don't talk on the phone during dinner, but for potential customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy. Customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy. Customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy. Customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy. Customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy. Customer Tom Ham, I will make an exception. Oh, boy.
Alrighty, so welcome to my stream. We're going to continue working on this uh, camel spider model that I've been playing with for the past few weeks. And uh, I did some detailing offline, still needs some work, but I thought today I can start getting into maybe doing some coloring and also talking a little bit about uh, fiber mesh. So um, as usual, my chat window is kind of screwed up so I can see the chat on Twitch. So if you have any questions or anything like that, you know, uh, please feel free to post them and I will try and answer them as much as possible. But for the most part, I want to kind of focus on painting this guy and also maybe doing some fiber mesh to get some of the hairs in here because you can see this guy is pretty hairy. So let's start with um, just kind of playing with the this model, this part of the model right here. I'm going to see if I can use fiber mesh to kind of get some of that hair going. And um, so I'll turn on the solo button. And what I'm going to do is um, let's, let's first take a look at what's going on here uh, with the with the uh, calissery. That's what these are called. These are not mandibles. These are calissery. So it's a similar um, part they'll find on spiders. Um, this is not a spider, it is an arachnid, so it's related to spiders, but not exactly the same thing. And you can see that it has lots of hair down in the middle right here. So basically for, for most arachnids, these are, well, these guys have jaws. I mean, if you take a look at it, it's like beyond just calissery because the spiders don't necessarily have jaws like this. This is more like a scorpion. But, um, I mean, similar to a scorpion, but uh, spiders generally have what they have, these giant cloistry, these, it depends on the spider, but they have the kind of the fangs coming out of the bottom, where these guys obviously have some kind of creepy ass jaw. And there's a lot of hair in between here, but not as much at the top. It's fairly sparse. If we take a look at some of the other pictures here, um, you can see that we have kind of long hairs in the top. And generally speaking, you usually have more hairs in the middle. At least that's what it looks like to me. You know, some of these pictures are kind of blurry. These are all found online. And this is one of my own photos right here. So you can see there's several different types of hair here. So this is a really good image to look at. So we've got hairs in, the, in between, long, sparser hairs in the top, medium length curled hairs here in the bottom, in the front, and on the bottom. So we're going to kind of play with that kind of notion. I think what I'm going to do is several different uh, fiber meshes for each different type of hair. And uh, so let's start with the hair in the middle here. And so I'm going to turn the solo back on and uh, find my stylus. There it is. And let me see, so this model is about 1.76 million points, this part of the model anyways. So I'm going to hold the control key and just start painting a mask here. And this is going to be the placement of the hairs that are on the inside here. I'm going to have to log in to see the chat.
All right, as I was saying, let's get some fiber mesh going in here. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm gonna go down here to the fiber mesh and let's do preview. So that's probably a bit on the dense side. So let's see about maybe going in here to Lightbox and see if we can find something a bit more uh, reasonable to start with. Just need sort of straight semi-dense hair. Curly hair, fiber, this one looks pretty good. Let's try this one. So a bit on the long side. And a bit frizzed out, but that's what settings are for. So then we'll go down here to fiber mesh and choose modifiers. Let's bring down the max number of fibers. Let's definitely bring down the length. So basically the way that fiber mesh works is I've, I've used the mass to determine where the uh, fiber mesh is gonna go and then I'm in preview mode and so in this mode I'm gonna go in here and just start playing with the settings until I get something close to what I want. I don't want to need a texture on here. And then once uh, I get it close, I'm gonna turn it into actual fibers which will make it another subtool. I can use a grooming brush to kind of straighten them out. If you want to convert them into polygons, you can actually convert them into mesh, but that's uh, a little, little ways off. So before we get to that point, let's get in here, bring down the length a little bit, and that's looking a little pubic. So maybe we can uh, lower down the gravity and actually, and get down to the clumps at zero. curly settings because this is a bit on the curly side. Sometimes it takes a while finding the right setting. So what I do is uh, see the obvious setting here. Let's go back in the light box. Let's see if we can find something that's a bit more straight. a little bit better. Move it on the green side, that's okay. I can turn this to white. This to white. And now let's get the length. I kind of want to have longer. Long hair is fine. Maybe max fiber, something like that. And then let's get the width profile. I'm going to reset this graph so I want to have a bit longer and the a bit thicker in the roots and thinner, it's a little bit too much. I'm going to put my mask a little bit and scale up the root.
twist. Turn the twist off. There we go. Now we're getting somewhere. It's just a matter of finding the right setting. So you can kind of see we're getting that. And now I think maybe I'll scale up the uh, roots a little bit. There we go. So I'm, I'm happy with that. The nice thing about doing bugs like this is it's pretty simple. Um, since they tend to be a bit on the straight side. Here, I'm going to just try segments a little bit. That's okay for starters. So I'm going to make this into a subtool. So I'll just choose accept. And let's turn off solo for a second. And I'm go in here and find a nice broom brush. too much so I'm going to lower the intensity brush. And typically when I do hair on bugs if I'm doing it for something that is going to be you know um, rendered in like Maya or something like that I will use like Yeti because I like to because I like the fact that with with that kind of fur system I can easily animate it. I'm going to hold the shift key. Do a little bit of smoothing. I'm going to hold the shift key and go to the brush palette here and under uh, fiber mesh. Yeah, hold the shift key. I'm going to turn up preserve length. So that way it smooths it without necessarily shrinking it. Second, I'm going to do a test here real quick just for fun. Go back to this Z tool, and then thinking about kind of the longer hairs that are kind of coming out here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to clear the mask, and I'm going to go in here and under masking, I'm going to do. Uh, let's try a cavity mask. Uh, not so much. Let's try peaks and valleys. The peaks and valleys is not bad because it's kind of getting the uh, the mask right there, kind of close to those little dots that I sculpted in there, which I, I kind of like. So I'm going to use that as a basis for my fiber mesh. And you can see even in my image down here, it's kind of got more towards the end here. So I kind of like that. Um, I might go into the masking uh, area and let's try boosting the mask a little bit. And I'm also going to shrink the mask. Mm, I don't like that. Let's go back to here. Let's try a sharpen mask. There we go. That looks a little bit better. And let's go in here. And I'm going to, I think what I'm going to do for these hairs is I'm going to do a third fiber mesh for those hairs. So I'm going to go in here and uh, just use the mask brush to kind of erase some of the mask here and just keep it on this part for these hairs. And I definitely don't want, I don't want the inside necessarily, maybe a little bit, some hairs in there would be cool. I don't want it on the teeth. So I'll paint the mask, so I'm holding control and alt to uh, clear the mask. And I don't need it up here.
I'm going to do is uh, let's go to fi uh, fiber mesh preview. same length. And in this case, I think I want the width to be, let's bring down the coverage, make it a little bit slimmer. I kind of want to have it longer and still sparser, too sparse. here and see if we can get a twist going in an interesting way. It's still a little bit chaotic, but we might be able to groom those a little bit more. Use the move brush, and I'm going to go into the brush settings for the move brush and also turn on preserve length so that it doesn't necessarily stretch them. And I'm going to lower the uh, move brush settings, so something like that. Let's do this again. So on my smooth brush, I also have preserved length sent to 100. That way I can smooth it and it won't shrink the, uh, the hairs. So I'm kind of happy with the overall length. All right, so look like that's pretty good. Okay, so let's turn these all on. Let's remember to save this. Whose mandibles are these? These are the mandibles, well, they're not mandibles, they're chelicerae, technically, uh, since this is an arachnid, and uh, they belong to the camel spider. So here's my reference right here. So this is also known as a sulfagit. So you can see, I mean, there's kind of variety in the way that the hair looks in these guys. 
Um, look at how thick these guys are, man. That guy's crazy. He's got like these big old thick hairs and then sparser hairs in there. The variety is just wonderful. Look at that. So that one's much more, has much more coverage. So, you know, it depends on the individual and the pictures. Some of these are my pictures. Some of these I grabbed off the web. So this is, this is a picture I took. It's been, it's been a couple hours hanging out with this guy. He's a lot of fun. Um, but the other thing I wanted to test out here is, okay, um, since I get some fiber mesh going, um, let's see what happens if I, uh, this will come over to uh, Keyshot. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into Renderer, and I'm going to go to External Renderer and turn on Keyshot, and let's see what happens if I hit a BPR. I got a mosquito in the studio, and it's chomping on my arms, so that if you see me scraping my arms like this, that's thanks to the mosquito. So I don't love all insects. I certainly am not a big fan of mosquitoes. But I am a fan of beer. Alrighty, let's see. Yeah, see, it's interesting because in Keyshot they look really, really sparse. Of course, I've got the same blue material on here. That's so probably not helping. But I, yeah, I'm not. I think that's okay. I think that looks pretty good. See if it goes in here. Eh, maybe it's a bit too sparse. I'm gonna hit the lighting and uh, let's set this to jewelry mode. It's always good to test while you go. So you can see, like these are working, I think, pretty well on the inside. But these are a little, a little too sparse, a little too thin. So I'm going to pause this and hide it. And let's do another pass on that. Okay, so I'm going to go to this one. Probably, let's delete it. Go back here. And let's go back into fiber mesh. Preview back on, and let's go in here to modifiers. Let's bring up the max fibers to 11.2, maybe 1.5. Let's try that. Let's get the coverage up a little bit. Okay, and let's accept that. Sub tool here. Make sure we're on the right sub tool. Here's my sub tools. Is there a technique that you wish you knew at the start of ZBrush or you came across later and you were like, that's game changing? Um, all of them? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them. Surface noise is a big one. So I get a lot of these fine details on here. Surface noise is huge. I always tell my students that um, mastering polygrouping like really understanding polygrouping is the key to mastering ZBrush, polygrouping and masking. Well, I kind of like that. Now I kind of want to have more down here though. Ah, eh, we'll do another pass. Um, but yeah, in terms of like fine detail, a lot of what I do here, 
take a break from fiber mesh fooling around and just talk a little bit about uh, some of my techniques for creating this kind of detail. For me, when you're doing detail, especially when you're doing on something like a real creature, and this is still needs a little bit of work on it, um, but the um, it's like cooking. It's not just the tool that you use, but how you use it. In other words, if all there was to cooking was heating things up, then everyone would use a microwave. But it's the way that you heat things up that makes the difference between a really good dish and an okay one. And so you can see on here, I wanted to create this kind of pitting effect, but I wanted to have it be somewhat true to kind of the look that we see here on some of these guys. Now I'm, I'm kind of pulling from a variety of pictures, so there's going to be variation here, and I'm, I'm being a little bit, I'm using artistic license in how I do some of these details. But I know there's an image in here, that, that a couple that I particularly like. It's too fuzzy. This one, yeah, that's a pretty good one. I mean, you can kind of see that there's a variety. I mean, there's, these things are really wild. I mean, look at the abdomen here. I mean, first of all, it looks like a big old weird sack. I mean, this is kind of soft tissue. It's not a hard sclera like you'd find in an ant. Uh, it's, it tends to be a bit softer and squishier. But you see how this, like, we have this very diffuse, hairy areas, and then for whatever bizarre reason, we have these, like, shinier plates, these sclera. And that's, you know, what you find on this species, but on the other species you have different types of details here. And this is the kind of stuff that I find really interesting. It's also a little bit frustrating to try and replicate sometimes, especially because it looks very different in different pictures. I mean, look at how different the abdomen looks here. You can see like the subsurface kind of stuff going on here. And, you know, these guys go through molts, so as they age, you know, they lose you know, they shed their uh, exoskeleton and they grow a new one. So depending on when you're getting a picture of these guys, you're going to see it in a very different state. But back to uh, how I use the noise. So what I did for uh, this, um, okay, cool. I still have my undo history here, so we can go back in time. Hopefully this won't be so slow that it crashes everything. slow but basically what I do is okay so I went through and you can see I kind of just sculpted dots on here just randomly using the Damien standard brush and uh, drag dots so that they were kind of a somewhat consistent size and once I kind of done some random dots all over the surface uh, I go through and I add some surface noise on top of that Let's just, let's just do it. I'm just going to delete the history here. So, um, so as I have that kind of drawn out, actually let's go a little bit further. So I'll go into uh, surface noise and kind of play with the scale. And I just want to get something that breaks this up and makes it look a bit more organic. You know, something like this. Something like that. And I'll go ahead and just apply it to the mesh, right? So that looks okay. It still looks kind of like uh, CG in that it's very, very uniform over the surface of the model. It's broken up this and made it look a little bit less fake, but we still have kind of an overall uniform kind of quality that's, that's not very interesting to look at. So here's a technique that I like to use. Um, and this is something I discovered by accident and what I mean by like cooking analogy. It's like how you use these tools uh, has a huge effect on how they work. So what I'll go in here is I'm going to go into the geometry palette and I'm going to hit clay polish. And what that's going to do is it's going to do an overall polish to the entire surface. And in the process it knocks off a lot of that detail. So what was the point of adding the surface detail if it's knocked on? knocked off. Well, the cool thing about this is that it leaves a mask behind. So if I go into flat color, you can see there's a very faint mask that is, it's like a cavity mask. It's very similar to a cavity mask, but it has a kind of, it's, it's using this sort of the detail that I've sculpted in the surface 
as part of generating that mask. So now what I'll do is I'll go back to my, uh, my material here. I'm going to invert the mask, control I to invert the mask, and then control H to hide it. And then I'll go over with like the inflate brush and I'll just start doing this kind of inflation and smoothing. So now you can see now this, that mask that was created by clay polish and the combination of the surface noise is getting something a much more organic and believable and I can also like it can hold the alt key and paint and you get kind of a different quality so I'll go over and paint very lightly with the inflate brush and alternate with inflate and smooth especially along these edges here so that the resulting detail is not as as uniform now it looks a bit more organic it's not just it's not just one surface noise over, applied over the entire thing. But you can also see, okay, so I'm losing some of that pitting that I sculpted in before. But that's okay because I want that pitting to be kind of a subsurface kind of quality. It's breaking up the silhouette of the surface in a micro detail in such a way that it makes it look like, you know, this thing is, is grown. This is, this is a result of, of cells, layers of cells you know, in the real world, layers of cells building on top of each other, and you get damage and you get other types of kind of quality of detail. And so I'll do this whole, go over the whole thing now with the inflate brush and the smooth brush and get that kind of variation in there. So it looks really neat and really cool and very organic. And then once I'm done all of that, and I'm happy with the way that it looks, I'll actually uh, clear the mask go in here with my Damien standard brush using the uh, drag dot and this alpha and I'm just going to go back in and redo all those dots maybe at a different scale maybe not quite in precisely in the same place but I'll go back and sort of re-dot it and so that that creates sort of a layer or layers of detail that makes it much more believable than just simply sculpting dots on the surface. So you can kind of see the difference in the quality between this area and this area. And that's kind of how I did it here on, on the head. You see how the dots are also, they're not perfect circles. They kind of got the star quality to them. I think that looks really cool. And then when I go to poly paint, I'll use a lot of masking to kind of take advantage of that sculpted detail so that I can bring out bring it out in the poly paint as well. And I haven't, I've done a little bit on the legs, but I haven't quite, fit, I'm still working on the legs. What I really did for the legs is I just sculpted one pair of legs pretty far, like this one, pretty far along. I'll probably do some more. And then I just duplicated that so that I didn't have to go back and re-sculpt all this stuff for each pair of legs. Because it's got a lot of legs. And then I'll, then I'll go in and add some, you know, I change the proportions a bit so that it's a bit more accurate because the legs lengths, like these tend to be shorter, these tend to be medium, the back legs tend to be longer. So I'll go back and finesse that a bit more. But um, that, you know, to answer your question that you asked forever ago, wow, I really got chomped up here, man. Um, that's one of those techniques that I've kind of discovered by accident over the years that, that I think is a great way to make detail. And even though it looks, you know, it looks like a lot of work because I do a lot of passes, it's actually pretty fast because I'm letting things like surface noise, a lot of the detail that I've already sculpted in the surface, take care of a lot of the work for me. So I'm kind of liking this. I think that looks pretty good. Have I converted this into a mesh yet? I forgot. Yes. Okay. So now, kind of like that. Let's see what happens if I. I'm going to go back to my uh, abdomen here. And now I'm going to have to redo some of that. Uh, that's okay. Um, I'm going to go in here and hit BPR and get some kind of weird warning message. Okay, let's unpause. Try that again. No problem, that's what I'm here for, man. Mm, does that look better? I guess so. It still looks really thin. Maybe it's a key shot thing, I don't know. I like it to be thicker. But let's add some more hair and see, see how it goes. 
I mean, fiber mesh is easy enough to redo. You can always. And sometimes as the rendering resolves and the anti-aliasing kicks in or whatever, it starts to look a little bit less wispy. But I don't know. I mean, maybe it kind of like it. Oh, you know what happened? It didn't actually send. That's I was looking at the older version. Let's go back to render, external render. There we go. Yeah, it didn't send it. I was looking at the earlier version. It's because I had Keyshot paused when I tried to send it over. Okay, that looks better. Okay, that looks better. I like that. That's my guy. You know what I love about these guys? Their eyes. I mean, this thing is looking so fearsome and terrifying, yet it's got these googly eyes that kind of completely defeat its terrifying look. You can see the real thing. The eyes are kind of like... Um, I think it's hysterical. I will say that, you know, so I took this picture in a light box with a, using a, a Canon uh, DSLR. And uh, these guys aren't very friendly. Um, it kept charging me and charging the camera. And as you can imagine, they could be a little bit on the scary side. So, yeah, it's it's fun taking pictures of these guys. The same thing with certain scorpions. They just, they like to run at you while you're holding the camera and then... It makes photography much more interesting. Okay, so let's do another round of hair just for, you know, fun, man. So I'm going to minimize this, go back to ZBrush, and let's do, let's click on this, and solo. And what I want to do is I want to do... You just look at these guys all day, right? Um, there it is. These hairs, this little mustache going on right here. It's the same thing with a lot of, especially spiders. Whenever I'm doing spiders, you know, it's, you really want to spend some time looking at it because it's not just one type of hair. They tend to have, well, I can see from my desk. Well, I can't really see my desktop. But yeah, you kind of can see. They have the little tiny seti, which is what they call the hairs, the longer hairs. Um, so I always like to kind of examine that and kind of take a look at how the hairs work. So actually, let's I'm gonna do this. Let's go down here and I'm going to do masking again. I just like to play with masking. I just think it's so much fun. Um, I'll try mask by smoothness. Yeah, so that's kind of nice. Um, let's bring up the range. And I don't always know exactly what the sliders are doing. I just play with them. Set the fall off to like 20. Ooh, that's kind of nice actually. See how that's almost perfectly in the divots there? Ooh, I like that. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, let's do this. Let's just clear off some of this. I kind of, I'm getting excited about this model. I spent some time over the past week, just a few hours here and there, going in and refining the details. Because um, in the earlier streams, it was looking a little, it was looking goofy for a long time. But now once it starts to take shape and get excited about it, I'm really looking forward to actually doing poly painting. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. But I like it when they get past the awkward teenage phase and they start to look more realistic. That's when I get excited. There's a lot of a lot of boring technical stuff I have to do beforehand to get to that point. Okay. Um, fiber mesh preview. Yeah. See, like by using that uh, that type of masking, I'm getting the fibers directly right in those little sockets there, which is cool. That's what I want. So, I know I'm being really fickle about the fiber mesh, but uh, I will say this though. Bugs are a lot easier than people when it comes to hair. 
because if a bug has a bad haircut, nobody really notices. But if a person, a character, their hair is even slightly off, it makes them look really stupid. Um, so that's why I like doing bugs. All right, let's do this. Let's go in here to fiber mesh. And, and I don't know anything about hair. Um, that's the other problem. Like I, I think a long time ago I caught myself um, looking through my wife's fashion magazines trying to understand hairstyles because I don't know a damn thing about I didn't go to beauty college, you know what I mean? So at that point I said, you know, maybe I should be a, more of a creature modeler than a character modeler. And um, I'm kind of happy with that decision. Um, yeah, you know, X-Gen, X-Gen I think is a, still clunky as hell. I'm not really happy with it. Uh, but I, I really, really do like Yeti a lot. Yeti has, Yeti's a pain in the butt to install. There's no doubt about that. Um, and, you know, it's a little bit expensive. You know, X-Gen comes with Maya. Um, but Yeti has the best grooming tools. The grooming tools are easy to use, easy to understand and set up. And so I kind of like that one the best. I will say I haven't, I know Blender, I shouldn't say the B word while I'm on the live stream, but I'll say it anyways. I haven't used Blender's hair tools, but they look like they're pretty good. See, this is what, this is what I want. This is exactly what I want. I'm much happier with this. That's great. That's looking. So, how did I do that? What made the difference? Pretty simple. I just used a different style of masking. I used mask by smoothness as, to, as opposed to peaks and valleys. And that got the mask right there into those little sculpted divots. So, eh, it's experimentation. You know. So, let's save this guy. I'm going to save him in a new version. Just because I redid some stuff in the admin. A think tank student. Cool. I guess that's better than a sensory deprivation tank student. Um, if you check out, actually, the picture of my live stream, this guy right here, this was done with Yeti. Sorry, I apologize. This is a female spider. This gal right here, this is all Yeti stuff. And I actually did a Noman Workshop video series on modeling the spider and creating the fur and Yeti and rendering in Redshift. So if you're curious about the whole uh, workflow, that is available in the Noman Workshop. Okay, I'm having fun with this, so let's do some more. I'm going to clear the mask out, and this time, let's do, let's go back to, Mask by Peaks and Valleys, because I like this right here, so, switch to Mask Lasso, and zoink, clear that out. pen, clear this out, I tend to hum a lot when I work. I'm going to go back in here, mask, let's do spray and let's do this let's go in here and increase the placement reduce the scale variation and let's make it slightly different there we go something like that so I'm just painting a mask here using the spray stroke and I'll hold the alt key and that out a bit. And 
get some hairs down here. We need a little bit down there. Um, hairs are important for bugs and arachnids, insects and arachnids, because since they don't have nerves in their skin like we do, they use hairs for a number of different things. The hairs act like a little trigger. If you look at a cross section of a diagram of a arthropod hair, they literally have like a little trigger at the root so that when the hair gets pushed one way or the other, it, they get the uh, nerve signal. So that helps them to see what, feel what's going around because they, they tend to have terrible eyesight. Um, they're also chemoreceptors, meaning that they trap um, compounds, aromatic compounds, whatever you want to call it, so they can actually smell their area. And then they can also use them the same way we use the hairs on our side of our ear as, uh, as hearing, right? They don't have ears, but they're covered, their bodies are covered in hair and they can sense, especially spiders, vibration. So they can't see you, but they sure as heck can hear you. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. So you, whenever, you're, whenever you're doing a bug, always look carefully at your reference and notice that almost all bugs, insects, and arachnids have some amount of hair somewhere. It might not be obvious at first, but it's almost always there in some form. Um, so if you and, and adding hair to your bugs is a great way to up the realism by like, you know a million percent. All right, that's hyperbole, but you know what I mean. It's um, Let's turn on this preview If you if you look at a model of a bug, it's kind of like if you're working on a human character and you don't put in eyelashes There's always it always looks like there's something wrong even if you even if you can't tell immediately if you do a crappy job in the eyelashes on a human character even if it's like a male character or something like that you may not see it at first but eventually you'll notice that it looks really really off whereas if you uh if you do a good job in the eyelashes it can really make a character pop so you can think of hairs on bugs the same way you gotta have gotta have the uh gotta have the hair uh, let's see, let's do coverage a little bit more, and that's too much. I think, okay, I think I want to bring down by mass. There we go. Let's make it a bit more uniform. Now let's bring down the max. Fine. There we go. That's kind of what I want. Just a good starting place there. You can try doing this. Move the gravity up. Yeah, because I want them to kind of move forward, kind of like this right here. Uh, so I've just positioned it so that this is facing down and increase the gravity a little bit. And then mm, a little less. Okay, let's do that. Turn on solo. There we go. So now we have several different types of hair here. And uh, turn on symmetry. The other thing about the hair in this guy that makes it a little bit easier is that uh, color-wise, they tend to be pretty uniform. I mean, it's like if I, if I add color to this, it'll probably just be a little bit on the roots, a little bit on the tips, you know. It doesn't have to be super fancy. As opposed to, like, some more elaborate looking bugs. That's looking pretty good. Let's save this. And see what it looks like on key shot.
think that came out too thin. Let's go back into ZBrush and yeah, I'm gonna get rid of this. Back over here, turn on preview. Let's bring up the coverage a little bit. And it's nice having that bridge to key shot because you can see how easy it is to test this stuff out as you're going. Because once you establish the basic preset, it's not that hard to, to change. Okay, so let's accept that. And send it over to Keyshot. Oops. That's not Keyshot. Not a huge difference, but let's see what it looks like with some better shading and lighting. I like this stuff in here. I think that's working. I like this stuff out here. I think that's working. This is a little bit thin, but it's okay. We're going to add more air. Let's take a look at our reference and see what's going on here uh, in the bottom. I don't know if it has as much hair. It's got some sparse long ones. These, you know, dismembered parts, you know, a lot of that hair may have fallen off in the process of dismembering it. So it's better to look at the live versions, but lower jaw does not look as hairy. I mean, it's hard to see, but I'm not seeing as much hair. Here's a good one. Okay, so maybe here in the bottom but not so much here in the teeth area. So that, that could be something we could do really quickly. So I'm gonna all click on this, switch to that subtool. And I think what I'm gonna do now, since that part is fairly smooth, I'm gonna go back to what I was doing here. Let's get a less soft. How far do this one? section going on here with this geometry that's okay. I'm gonna hold control and alt just to break that up a little bit so it's not too dense. So something like that. And then I think what I'm gonna do is let's go back to this guy and under fiber mesh. Fiber, fiber, fiber mesh. Where did you go, fiber mesh? There we go. Turn to the preview. I'm going to I just copy this. I'm going to save this as my own preset. We'll just call this hair. So saving a preset makes it easier to apply it to different parts of the model. Let's go back here and turn it off again. Here, here, and let's do it. You know, I need to break these things in folders and make things life a lot easier. I haven't done that yet. Um, so 
so now I'm going to open that preset that I just saved. There we go. So that copies it. So I don't have to go through all of that again. Please give me a starting point. Let's bring down the max fibers. Let's bring up coverage. Let's make the length a little bit longer. That's too many. That looks pretty good. So let's accept that. So once you get a roll going, this stuff gets faster. I'm just going to move this down here. Let's create a new folder and call it hair. We can put all the hair in here. Let's take the move brush and just can pull this out just a little bit. I don't think it needs a whole lot of work. Maybe just a little smoothing. Mm -hmm. uh, looking pretty fierce, right? I mean, you know what's interesting about this is... Um, without the hair. I mean, it looks pretty cool. With the hair, it actually looks angry and vicious. I mean, this is adding kind of like, ah, kind of an aggressiveness to it that I think is really cool. It's helping to, to make it look really psychotic. I mean, it's just like if you see a character with freaked out hair, right? Um, so there we go. So let's see this. And... Send it to Keisha. Yeah, I mean, look at it from the front. That thing was, just looks really, really pissed off. And that's the essential personality of this particular life form. Angry, angry, angry. Because a lot of these guys, you know, they're clearly, you know, reincarnated souls. So this is where karma will get you. If you're a mean person, you're going to end up as a soul fidget with a bad attitude. And some nerd is going to take pictures of you and torment you. So be good to your mother's people. I got this on the wrong axis, which is why it's, it's so weird. Looking pretty cool. thinking are we thinking uh, let's do the top of the head so I'm having fun with this okay let me turn on the solo button so what I'm gonna do here is my god I mean this looks like a McDonald land character sorry no offense there little guy but you look ridiculous. Um, let's go back to masking. We had some good success with mask by peaks and bounce, or no, mask by smoothness. Let's try that. That's a little bit. Uh, let's do a little bit more concise. Mm, 
Okay. So we got that. Now let's go in here. Let's actually try a range of 60. Not much different. Let's try to fall off of 10. That's pretty good. Let's do. Uh, uh, Okay, and then let's go in here to boost mask. Mm. Let's try dilute mask. Boost mask. Dilute mask. Boot mask. Yeah, that's pretty good. We could do shrink mask. Ooh, I like that. There we go. Okay. And then I'm going to go in here, hold the control key. Let's set this back to freehand, turn this off, and just erase some of this. It's too much. careful when painting a mask because if you hold, hit the shift key or sorry if you control tap it it blurs the mask and that's not what we want um, make sure they don't have mask going out of the eye I mean hair going out of the eyes yeah because I want this to be somewhat sparse doesn't have to be crazy Take a look at our reference. I mean, it's kind of like the hair, this hair right here. So, fiber mesh, preview. Let's open that preset that I saved. So I don't have to redo as much. And it's looking pretty good. We got some stuff going on here. So turn off the preview. I mean, you could have hair in here in the mouth. That wouldn't be the end of the world, but it might be a waste of resources. Can I paint the mask? No. Okay. That's definitely looking like a Muppet. Looks like a rejected Muppet. Let's make the length a bit longer. Let's bring the gravity down. The gravity if I bring down by mass, then it'll make the length a bit more uniform. <clears throat> Do I want to become famous? The robot wants to know if I want to become famous. No, don't. <laughs> Fame is highly overrated. Look at how miserable most famous people are. I don't want to be those people, man. I just want to make bugs and ZBrush, man. That's what I want to do. Okay. I 
think our current dystopia that we're living through right now, if I might pontificate, oh, I know you're excited about me rambling about stupid crap again, but it's a combination of Andy Warhol's 15 Minutes of Fame and George Orwell's 1984. So, it's what I like to call Warhol Wellian. Warhol Wellian is the name of the age that we're living through now. I'll let you guys contemplate that, but I'm going to go back to talking about bugs because really I have no business talking about philosophy. Okay, let's turn it on. Do I need to do this? Is it going to help me? What I might do is I'm going to go to the move brush and bring up, bring down preserve length just a little bit so that I can kind of pull this out a little bit without going too crazy. And then use the smooth brush to kind of melt to smooth it. The other thing, maybe I'll go, I'm going to hold the ship key and I'll do the same thing with the smooth brush. Pull down, hold the ship key, come on baby. Oh, it seems to be either on or off, hmm, interesting. That seems like a bug to me. Okay. Is it looking silly? I don't know. <laughs> it's looking ridiculous. I love it. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of like a, I don't know, like a baboon or something in a way. Um, let's send it over to uh, Keisha. I swear I'm not using Keisha just as an excuse to drink beer. Yeah, see, now it's, this is looking better, I think, in Keyshot than it does in ZBrush. Because this, this kind of sparseness, I think, is good. pretty rad when I paint it, I think. What a ridiculous creature. And as I often say, I like doing realistic, anatomically accurate bugs because you learn so much more about creature design. I mean, this looks like something to be rejected by a lot of art directors. But there's so much wild stuff to learn from looking at these guys that you might not think of if you're just designing an alien or kit bashing. You know what I mean? So this is doing, you know, realistic bugs is a great way to build up your mental library of shape language. Let's do the body here. For the body, I think the body is going to be pretty just much general, general hairiness. I haven't been able to find a really good picture of the upper side of this seg segment that comes between the abdomen and the head here. I mean, what makes this different from, say, a typical spider, right? I mean, if we're looking at spider anatomy, this is much closer to like a scorpion. Because a spider basically, 
all the legs come out of the head and then it has the abdomen. So the spiders have what's known as a cephalothorax, cephala meaning indicating head. And um, so I should bring a picture of a spider in here, shouldn't I? Wouldn't that make life a lot easier? Um, let's go to the old... Uh, Open up here. Okay. Let me get spider in here. So here's a jumping spider. Here's a good picture. So with typical spider anatomy, even if it's a jumping spider, a tarantula, it doesn't really matter, black widow. They still have the same basic anatomical uh, structure, which is you have an abdomen, which is a separate independent part. This is where most of the internal organs are, spinnerets, the book lungs, and uh, genitals, the whole bit. And then you have the cephalothorax, which is one structure that has the eyes, the brain, the mouth parts, and the legs, right? So everything's coming out of this one blob and then you basically have two main part and then a bunch of legs that's spiders insects tend to have three segments so let me see if i find a good ant in here here's an ant okay ants are great to study because the ant has the most visible anatomical structure of typical of an insect. So an insect, you have a head, you have the antennae, eyes, mouth parts, thorax. Sometimes the thorax is divided into sub-segments, but for the most part, it's one, one major segment. And then you have the abdomen, right? Head, thorax, abdomen, and all the legs come out of the thorax. With beetles, the thorax might be in two different pieces, but for the most part, legs come out of the thorax. So with this guy, we have a different arrangement altogether. We kind of have, we have a head, which is a distinct structure. We have an abdomen, which is a distinct structure. But then we have all the legs coming out of this body part right here. So that's kind of an interesting distinction between what you would find in an insect or an arachnid. So a little, little anatomy there for you. Um, once you learn this stuff, of course, you become a pain in the butt when you're watching a movie with your friends and you have to point out all the inaccuracies in uh, insect and other stuff. Um, the one other bug I wanted to show here, and, and my absolute favorite, is the Emblypagid, this guy right here. So here's, this is another arachnid and this, of course, is more closely related to the bug that I'm working on now than, say, a spider. But let me see if we can find it. Okay, so again, we have abdomen. This one has more of a cephalothorax, so it's a bit closer to a spider. So in this case, so I take that back. This is closer to a spider, and then it has main body part right here, abdomen, and then all the legs come out of the body part, and then it has... The, uh, the mouth parts as well. So you guys might recognize this critter featured in Harry Potter. Uh, they are really awesome organisms. They're one of my favorites. I've had one crawling on my hand before at a bug fair. They're really docile. I mean, they look terrifying. They're not like these guys. Just don't mess with them because they'll, they'll attack you. Um, don't kill them either. Just get away from them. But... Uh, and blypigids, they're quite, they're quite gentle, actually, unless you're a cricket. Okay, so let's go in here, and I think what I want to do, rather than just going through and just adding more and more hair, because that gets a bit repetitive, uh, I'm going to start doing some poly painting on this guy, because I think that's what I'm excited about. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the hair. Let's get that last bit in there. 
this one right here. Okay. And there we go. Let's all click on this, clear the mask. And um, we're going to do some poly painting. So I'm going to switch over to skin shaded material. Let's take a look at our reference. I know kind of what I want. I mean, as you can see, there's there's a fair amount of variety. If you see, I mean, this one, this is an African species and it tends to be fairly dark. It might also be very dark because of its age. So a lot of these arthropods tend to get darker colors as they get older, but it could also just be the species. But I kind of like, I tend to lean towards bright orange. So I kind of want to do something along the lines of these bright orange colors like this one I like a lot like this kind of stuff the orange and the yellow and the brown I think that looks cool so I'm gonna go for something like that I'm I'm doing a mishmash I don't even know how many species there are of this particular animal so I'm just gonna I'm doing a blend this is a mutant and let's go in here and pick an orange color a pinkish hue I like a pinkish hue like that maybe a little darker and set RGB to 100 and I'm just going to do color fill object let's go to paint my paintbrush going and I'm also going to hold the shift key so I've got my smooth brush activated I'm going to turn off Z add so that is the smooth brush is now a blur brush I'll lower the RGB intensity and then I'm going to go in here and find my masking. Let's do mask by peaks and valleys. So I'm going to take advantage of all the detail that I sculpted in here, which makes poly painting a lot faster. And I'm going to control eight, control I to invert the mask, control H to hide it. I'm going to pick maybe a darker reddish color. Lower my RGB intensity and choose color fill object and just hit it a few times so I can get a little bit of color variation in there. And it's going into that masked area or going into the unmasked area. So let's do mask by smoothness now. And I'm gonna invert the mask, hide the mask. And let's do a really dark red. That's a little too cherry. And fill. All right, so you can see now I've got, already got some color going there. And uh, let's go into the paint brush and I'm going to do color spray. In the settings, I'm gonna set the color to zero. This color slider right here, this adds an intensity variance or a hue variance, which I don't want, I wanna keep kind of a uniform color overall. Let's get like a sandy yellow and bring down the RGB intensity a lot. And just start to, let's turn on, I'm gonna clear the mask. Bring down the intensity a little bit, there we go. Start to brush over this to create kind of a subsurface quality here. So I'm going to hold the shift key, which is going to activate that blur brush to blend the colors together. And just paint over this. So, um, you know, I might make this look, you know, a lot more color variance than you might see in the pictures. Because, I mean, if we look at our reference and just focus on the head here. Let's see if we can get a good picture of the head. You know, at first glance, it looks like, oh, the head's orange, and that's all there is to it. But the closer you look at these guys, you can start to see that there's a lot of variation, especially darkness around the edges, different hues. We've got more of a sandy brown here, reddish pink orange over here, even purples, even blues, and darkness around the eyes. So I really want to, I want to bring up that intensity of 
the variation because if I render this and I'll you know probably render this in key shot but you know I want to have this thing to be very translucent so the material that I choose in key shot that translucency is going to kind of make the color variation a little bit less obvious so I might be make this a bit more exaggerated in ZBrush and let's uh, let's get that really dark it's purplish. And that's going to be pretty cool. Let's get black. The other thing is, I think in my placement, I can narrow the placement a little bit, so it's not such a widespread. I think that's okay. So the question I get a lot is, why do I do poly painting as opposed to using substance or marmoset? I actually do use, well, these days I've been using marmoset. I talked about this a little bit last live stream. Um, I just like the poly paint brushes and ZBrush. I like the way that they work. And uh, since I'm so familiar with ZBrush brushes, it's easier for me to get the desired effect. I still use the other texturing programs, mainly for baking and then doing for fine detailing, super fine detailing and, and that kind of stuff, but also baking and making occlusion maps and that kind of stuff and you know other effects, different material types. So I use both. I'm gonna press C while I'm hovering over this to select that color. So I can do a little bit more blending here. So I think I got too dark down here. Yeah, it looks kind of hungover. Um, I'm gonna get a little bit wacky and throw some blue, some desaturated blue in here. Oh yeah, that's looking good. It's looking pretty wild. I like to see when I'm looking at animals, especially invertebrates, how they use sometimes even complementary colors in their patterning. And these aren't complementary colors for their animals. Blue and orange, but they're almost, I mean, they're almost on the opposite sides of this color picker anyways. I always find it kind of interesting. The uh, insects, in, sorry, this is an arachnid. Invertebrates and other animals, you, you know, coloring is in some cases sort of just an effect of their age or whatever or their circumstance, but a lot of times it's also it really helps the animal help to draw attention to certain parts of its body, especially if it wants to scare the crap out of you. Um, Case in point, I mentioned this before, see how the, it gets dark here towards the end? It really draws attention. This, this gets really obvious. It really draws your eye to this sharp, nasty, scary bit. And it's a, it's a great way to signal don't mess with me because it's hard to miss. So this is a, a point, I made this point before and I apologize if I'm repeating myself, but for creature designers, you know, pay attention to the coloring. Because sometimes it'll be the opposite. Sometimes you'll have a dark part and then the lightness will appear at that point where he wants you to draw, wants to draw attention. But that's the kind of coloring that you really gotta have in your creature designs because man, does it increase the drama. I mean, it's hard to miss this. It's always about contrast, you know, the contrast of the colors. Uh, do you use layers for, um, I use, I don't like using ZBrush layers personally, I just, I always forget which layer I'm working on, and I find with poly painting the layers are sometimes can get a bit buggy. They may have fixed it. Some people like to use layers. I'm, I like to paint everything in a single layer. In fact, I just don't use the 3D layers as much as I should probably. It's probably because I've been using ZBrush for too long. Since, since before they had layers. So I'm kind of used to working this way.
So I like to work on one subtool to kind of establish the basic color language of the organism. And then as I get happier with that, I'll start to take it into the other parts of the critter. So kind of establishing kind of rules in a way for how how this is the colors can be applied. Let's add some darkness right here in the neck. I think I need some more darkness over here. The other thing I like to do um, is I'm going to throw an alpha on here, like maybe this teeny weeny dot, bring up the RGB intensity and maybe increase the placement. And maybe I pick a darker color right here and then let's see. This can kind of break up that color even more, make it look more like a pigment on the surface. And I'm gonna hold the shift key and smooth well, I'm blurring because I have Z-Add turned off in RGB. Let's bring up the RGB intensity. So do a pass of color with some speckling on here. Blur it and then do another pass on top of it. And this will start to make give it a, the look of a subsurface kind of quality. We can also see how we're having a nice breakup as we transition from lighter areas, lighter in color areas to darker areas. I kind of like that a lot too. And then you can do the opposite. So maybe I'll select this yellow color and bring it up a little bit and touch on the border. Hit it with the blur brush. Get a little subsurface kind of quality in there. I just found something sticky on my Cintiq. That's gross. Um, just go back and forth, you know, it's like, reddish color in there. The other thing you could do is um, let's go into the material palette and let's bring up the wax modifier. Let's make sure we go into render render properties, turn on wax preview. So we just get a little hint of what that subsurface kind of quality might look like. Oh, the other thing is I have lazy mouse. I don't need lazy mouse on here. There we go. So that wax preview kind of gives you an idea how a lot of the color variation gets a little bit lost as you, as you add translucency. So that way I can kind of get an idea. I like this, this color orange right here. Let me bring this out. So I'm sampling colors just by holding over the colors I like and hitting the C hot key that samples it. And by you know constantly sampling the colors and painting over the other areas, it just allows me to blend a bit more. I kind of like, I like the transitions over the surface in these different areas. Let's bring up RGB intensity. Let's do this alpha. So I'm just switching up alphas every once in a while. Let's bring back some of that sandy color. I like that. RGB intensity is too high now. Let's bring this down. Looking pretty 
looking good. That doesn't want to turn on the floor. Let's see. I'm going to save this. Let's see, there's 19. And let's take a look at what it looks like in Keyshot. So it's using that same material, so it looks like crap. That's okay. Um, let's go into material here. Let's go into this. Let's go into, where's my little library? Cloud library. Not logged in, what are you talking about? Sorry, something's happened to my key, sh key shot setup, so. If you're working with key shot materials and you still want to see the poly paint, what you can do is go into the material editor, select that material, whatever this is. Double click on it. Go into the material graph for key shot. And so we have a noise texture going to the bump here. I don't really need that. Let's get rid of that. But what we need is uh, a texture for the diffuse to bring in the poly paint. So I'm going to go in here and go to textures and find myself vertex color. That's the poly paint. Put this into diffuse. Diffuse, thank you. Now I can see our poly paint on there. Eh, it looks all right. It, part of it's the lighting is I've got a really lame lighting set up in here, so it's not going to look that exciting. But you can, do get an idea of, you know, in a somewhat translucent surface, how this might look. You know, key shot materials can actually, you know, they're not quite as sophisticated as like a redshift material, but they can be pretty sophisticated, like, you know, um, You can go in here and I can actually find like a curvature texture. You know, put this into the diffuse instead of the vertex paint. And that's a great way to bring out some of the detail. The default colors are a little bit goofy, but if I double click on this, double click, whoops, double click on this, then go in here and change some of this. You know. Okay, that looks silly, but you know, kind of interesting. Brings out some of the detail. It takes longer to render too, though. I'll probably spend some time coming up with a better material, but yeah, whatever. It was worth a shot. Let's go back into ZBrush because that's why we're here. I guess, you know, um, in the future, probably, if you're going to be using ZBrush in the full suite of Maxon product, products, probably start using Redshift more and more. I've been using Redshift for a while with Maya, and I really like it. It's my favorite rendering tool. It's a lot like V-Ray um, in terms of the approach and, you know, types of materials. Turn on poly paint. I'm going to fill this with a dark black color. 
Uh, what do you think about modeling a ZBrush for mass production plastic parts such as buckets, plastic bottles, etc.? That's an interesting question. Um, Well, certainly with Z Modeler, I mean, you can create pretty quickly. I mean, Z Modeler, the Z Modeler brush is a lot like a modeling tool, a polygon modeling tool that you find in other programs like Maya or Blender or whatever. So, and it works just as well. I mean, I think if you get fast with it, <coughs> you can you can create those types of objects pretty quickly. Where, where a Z brush gets really good, though, is if you're if you really want to you're trying to get like a particular bottle shape or some kind of surface noise or some kind of surface quality, then ZBrush is excellent at that, especially if you're also trying to work with a specific contour. I use ZBrush for modeling all kinds of things, not just bugs or, or characters and creatures, but um, you know, even I do like everyday things. Or, or when a lot of times I'll take a model that I start in Maya and I'll bring it into ZBrush to add some dense and surface detail and that kind of stuff so i think it's i think it's a great tool for that um especially like poly painting and that kind of thing what was i doing oh i want to fill the eyes here with a color and i want to fill it with a dark reddish objects there we go beady little eyes let's make them even darker than that i don't know if that answers your question but uh I use I also use ZBrush for making jewelry, um, and you will probably be shocked to find that the jewelry I make is, whoops, insect themed. But you know, so this is this is cast in sterling silver, and that was all sculpted in ZBrush, and then 3D printed. So have some, this is a tardigrade ring that I'm working on right now. <laughs> it's adorable. I don't know who's ever going to wear it, but I like it. Uh, that's just a resin print from my own 3D printer. Uh, this is a ring that I just did recently, which I'm really proud of. I think it came out wonderfully. It's basically a honeycomb, and these are the faces of the little bee pupa. And you can see there's flowers on the side. This is a big, chunky ring. Um, and I have like honey pouring over on the sides and then there's a honeycomb on the sides of the ring. It really came out nicely. I'm really excited about it. So that's an example of a mass produced part, I guess. Well, I've only print cast two of them, so I don't know if that counts as mass, but, but I was done entirely in ZBrush. I mean, sculpt was anyways. Uh... Do I think I can get the same result as SolidWorks? I don't know, because I've never used SolidWorks. So, I can't. I can't answer that question. But, um, Tomas Vittelsbach, who does stream every Monday, he's good at answering that kind of stuff, because he has more experience with things like SolidWorks than I do. So, I would say definitely. I, I, I work with him. We, we run ZBrush Jewelry Workshops together along with uh, Henry Williams and Tony Rodriguez. And uh, it's a cool place to learn. Check it out, zbrushjewelryworkshop.com. Um, thanks for giving me an opportunity to plug my stuff here. I always appreciate that. <laughs> uh, so let's say I want to start bringing some of these colors into the bandables here. I'm going to press C to select that orange color. And again, I'm going to set the RGB intensity to 100 and do a color fill. And let's bring the RGB intensity down a little bit. Let's go in here to... Uh, masking. And let's try mask by smoothness. That looks pretty well. I'm going to invert the mask, hide the mask, pick maybe a dark reddish color. Uh, and then let's fill that color. Zoink, 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 zoink. Oh, isn't that beautiful? I love it. All that sculpted detail comes in handy. Look at the teeth here. That came out great, too. So, save me some trouble. Let's do it again. Let's do mass peaks and valleys. Turn off my AC here. Hopefully it's a little bit less noisy. Um, this room heats up really, really quickly, so if I don't have the AC on, I start to melt. 
let's hide that mask. Let's get that going. So I'm just doing kind of an establishing, just a coat for some simple detail. And now I think what I'll do is I'm going to select these dark colors here, press C, and start to work on this part. Let's clear the mask. Turn on solo. There we go. Looking kind of fierce. Fierce baby. Let's get the teeth. As you make the teeth darker, they'll definitely look scarier. how brutal these things are. I mean, this is just like, you know, we have, we human beings, we have really complicated teeth. I mean, just go to the dentist, man. And as you sit in that chair and people fuss over your gums and the tartar and the tack, plaque and the flossing and the x-rays and all that kind of stuff, it just makes you remind you that human teeth Really complicated. These teeth, very simple. They're just the here for shredding stuff. They just stick out. They're pointy things. Evolution said, ah, that's good enough. The spiders, of course, will don't really have teeth like this so much. They, what they do is, of course, they inject venom and then they basically liquefy the interior of the whatever they're trying to eat and then suck it out from the inside. It's a bit more elegant, you know? It does drive me crazy. I mean, I know that, you know, in Lord of the Rings, Shelob is not really a spider. Shelob is like a demon from the old world or something like that. A very, very old demon. But it still bothers me that they gave her a stinger on her abdomen where the spinneret should be because the spiders don't have stingers. Scorpions do, but spiders don't. But technically, she's not really a spider. She's a spider-like demon. Does anybody know if the uh, Lord of the Rings series has started yet on Amazon? Has anybody watched the trailer for the Lord of the Rings series and the Game of Thrones series to see if they can tell the difference between the two? I think if you're not paying attention, you're going to get mixed up. A lot of elf crap going on. Elf crap. Actually, that would be a great name for a series. Let's do a series called Elf Crap. The basic premise is that Elves of the old world have magical crap. And so these dwarves are invading the elf land and raiding their latrines to see if they can harvest the elf crap and cast spells with it. But this is why nobody lets me do serious, man. My ideas are terrible.
last week on Elfcraft. So I think this has gotten a little bit out of hand, so I'm going to bring up the RGB intensity. Let's go back to the spray stroke right here. Give this sandy, desaturated kind of color. Oops, that's too much. Just down a bit. And just start to knock that. Hold the shift key for a little bit of blurring there and just blend these things. Blend, blend, blend. So much fun. Might be fun to, uh, I haven't really done much with cavity masking, so let's do a mask by cavity. And then I'm gonna invert that, hide that mask, and let's fill with like a lighter pink, just to see what happens. Kinda gives it a nice quality there. It's just laying colors on top of each other, and then I'm gonna use the blur brush to blend that together. That looks nice. I like that. That looks like a nice kind of pigment. Very natural, very organic. And also brings out the detail that I sculpted in here pretty nicely. So that works pretty well. We lost the darkness inside the pits here, but we don't have to bring that back. I'm going to undo that a little bit. I think the blur brush is too strong. I'm going to hold shift, bring down my RGB intensity for the, blue, for the smooth brush. Too much. Okay, just find a nice bear. We go. That's that's kind of cool. You can see you're getting kind of a nice little subsurface kind of quality there. It looks like pigments. I mean, a great call, a great example of that in my reference image. This is a really great example of kind of really interesting sun. Of, I don't know what's going on here. I haven't the slightest idea, but you can see that really cool kind of subsurface detail looks like it's something underneath the surface of the square lights well that's what subsurface means but you can see how it's more prominent these areas less over here i mean that's just such a cool detail i don't know what's going on All right, so um, I'm gonna call it an evening because I'm getting messages from my uh, neighbor. So I wanna thank everybody for joining me on this live stream. I hope you got a lot out of it. And um, And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. So I'll work on this or I'll work on another bug or get something else started here. But uh, let's take a quick look at what we've accomplished today. Got some color going. Got some fiber mesh going. Looks a little weird because of the color. Let's do this. There we go. So we made some progress, getting some personality. I like him, I think he's doing well. So um, I'll see you guys in a couple weeks. Thank you very much for joining me. I uh, hope you enjoyed it and uh, do more Z brushing, man. <laughs>